In this episode, you will learn about semantic interoperability for industrial IoT using the MT Connect communication standard. We discuss the basics of an MT Connect information model, components required to put together an MT Connect system, differences and integration of MT Connect with other standards, and the use cases of MT Connect in industry. My guest on this episode is Russ Wedell. Russ is the managing director for the MT Connect Institute and is responsible for day-to-day -day business operations and standards development activities. Prior to this role, he worked at AMT as an industry economist, where he provided statistical research for sales and marketing in the manufacturing technology industry. He holds a BA of Economics from the College of William and Mary. Quick thank you to our sponsors. This episode is made possible by our friends at Hive MQ, the providers of an enterprise-grade, edge and cloud-based MQTT broker, and up to 22 manufacturers of reliable industrial controllers for automation and IIoT applications. So please do check them out to help support this podcast. Welcome to the fourth generation podcast here on industry 4 TV, which is a series of weekly interviews designed to help you learn IIoT from some of the world's leading practitioners. So make sure to subscribe and click on the notification bell to make sure that you never miss any of the videos. If you find this conversation interesting, please review it with five stars on Apple Podcasts, follow on Spotify, and connect with me on LinkedIn at Kutsai Mandi Teresa. Now, here is my conversation with Russ. Okay, uh, Russell, thank you so much for joining us today. I would like to welcome you to the show. It's great to be here. I really appreciate the opportunity. Awesome. Okay, so today I want to talk to you about the MT Connect communication standard, uh, which is all about uh, enabling semantic interoperability between industrial systems. So to set the foundation here, uh, can you uh, begin by explaining to us uh, what is meant by semantic interoperability and uh, what are the benefits? So it's a, it's a lot of fancy words to say a relatively simple thing. Semantic interoperability is about using the same definitions for all devices. So kind of in the, in the digital factory space, that means that you have um, the same terms, the same units. Um, these are all agreed upon either at a particular company or at, uh, within an industry or inside a sort of like a global standards development organization. So in our case, we're defining uh, mostly things about discrete manufacturing equipment, machine tools, um, fabricating equipment, industrial 3D printers, that kind of thing. And we do things like specify that an axis is defined you know, as rotational axis versus linear axis. Um, we do things like specify instead of uh, rotary axis being you know, measured in RPMs, we would measure it in a rotary velocity. Right. And, and so that's the definition piece. That's half of semantics. The other half of semantics is um, contextual meaning. So understanding things like, you know, a rotary axis is a subset of axes, which is a, a wider group. So it's a structure for the data and then the definitions for the data inside that structure. Oh, OK. Awesome. So can you give us like a beginner's introduction to MT Connect? Yeah, of course. So the MT Connect spec, the, the standard itself, is just a set of rules and definitions. So we, we do two things in the standard. Uh, we, we define the semantics, which I just kind of described what the purpose of that is. And the second piece is the protocol to uh, communicate data back and forth between devices. So it's sort of how you set up a port, um, how an MT Connect agent is intended to behave um, in order to be able to pass data from place to place. And uh, pass those data definitions from, from one device to another. So uh, from a user's perspective, they're mostly less concerned with the standard itself and they're more concerned with an implementation. So they're, they're going to be coming to MT Connect by way of some use case that they have in mind. They want to do lights out manufacturing or they want to integrate um, automation onto a, an, onto a machine or they want to do shop floor monitoring, OEE measurement, status reporting, that kind of thing but they want to do it for an entire shop with a whole bunch of different brands and types of equipment. And they don't want to spend their time uh, on translations from, you know, we're going to do 
axis, A-X-I-S underscore one, uh, all lowercase versus sort of capital letters for the whole thing with no, you know, with no space uh, versus just numeric codes for things. So it, it saves the effort of trying to integrate and, and create a translation from one device to another device to another device. Because you've got your own definitions for your equipment. I've got my definitions for my equipment. Um, once the, the builders and the, the equipment vendors agree, well, okay, we'll output data in this normalized you know, standardized definition, that means that the customer spends less time and cost on integration. And the real headache is when you try and do this with more than sort of three or four brands of things. So once you get, you know, one to one is not too difficult. One to two, you have to make a new connection for every uh, to each piece. So you end up with this, um, this, this exponential growth and how many connections you have to build if you don't do sort of a, a one to one to many uh, translation to the central standardized uh, definitions. Oh, okay, it's interesting. Now let, let's talk about the actual MT Connect information model. Uh, can you can you give us like a high level description of the structure of an MT Connect information model, and also uh, perhaps the mention the encoding mechanism that is used there. Sure. So MT Connect is all based on XML. When we talk about semantic interoperability and the the structure of the data XML is what allows us to put a schema to to the definitions. So um, the terms themselves can be defined without XML, but the representation in XML is where you get the relationships of this is part of this, that's part of the other thing, and so on and so forth. So what you're actually uh, consuming, if you have say a CNC mill, uh, that machine, if it's got MT Connect running on it, it would have uh, it would output an XML file. There's essentially the MT Connect agent sets up a, an HTTP server and an API with three calls. You've got a probe call, a current, and a sample. So the probe is giving you device information. That's essentially sort of the things you'd be concerned about with, with something like a discovery sort of function. So it's going to tell you what's the make and model of the equipment, what version of the MT Connect adapter is running, uh, what are the various data items that that machine is capable of, of putting out um, and then kind of give you a functional model of uh, what are the pieces of that, that machine. That's the kind of like the device model. Then you can stream. Uh, the second piece is streaming data that gets you your sample or your current. The current is sort of a, a one-time snapshot. This is going to give you what's currently going on with each of those things that are defined in the device model. Then the uh, Sample is basically just a, a buffered uh, sampling of current data across multiple timestamps. So that's the that's the data model. Uh, I think that was your whole question. I, maybe yeah. I missed a piece of it though. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so you've you've uh, you've already mentioned a couple of terms there, like uh, agent. So can, can you like give us a, a a full picture of the architectural components that are required to put together? an empty connect system, and then maybe just dis, uh, define uh, the purpose of each component. Sure, yeah, and if, if for anybody that's listening and trying to follow along here, you don't have to memorize all this stuff. If you just go to uh, our website is mtconnect.org, the architecture is laid out in the getting started section. So look for the big giant getting started buttons all over the place and it'll, it'll kind of explain all this stuff, but I'll go from the device to the application layer. So the device layer is a machine tool or a sensor or a sensor controller or whatever whatever thing is the source for the, the original source for the data. Uh, and that, you know, is it has some data model that's native to that device. That's translated into the MT Connect standard through an adapter. And that adapter is is generally proprietary software that's supplied by the builder that performs the explicit function of translating, you know, native term to MT Connect term for, for every term that that adapter and that, that device is going to support. So those, those adapters are generally software only drivers. Um, if you're thinking in kind of like the Windows environment, it's a, it's a device driver like you'd have for a camera or a printer or whatever other peripheral that has a device driver. If you're thinking in Linux terms, it's a library, um, basically. So that driver is generally supplied by, you know, if it's a CNC control, it would be supplied by FANUC or a FANUC integrator or a software company that works with FANUC. It may be provided by the machine tool builder themselves. So like Okuma, Mazak, Makino, I think build all their own adapters. 
And then there's third parties who may supply that by just writing the code um, on top of it. So like in Fanuc's case, they have their own API, the focus libraries, empty connect adapters uh, are written on top of the focus libraries by third parties, or the Fanuc adapter itself is supplied straight from Fanuc. That adapter is, is giving you the translated data, but that basically just spits out in a never ending stream. Like think about, you know, the matrix, just ones and zeros scrolling yeah. down the screen. So the parsing that into something that an application can read and, and has some actual structure to it, that's the function of the MT Connect agent. And more than 90% of installations use the free open source uh, C++ agent. Um, that's an application that runs either on your device itself, if the device isn't resource constrained, so you have you know, enough extra computing power and memory available to run a C++ application and set up an HTTP, HTTP server. Um, it's frequently run on something like a CNC control, or uh, if a PLC is more towards the industrial PC side in terms of capability, you might run it on the PLC. It's very frequently run on a workstation or a server kind of in a, a shop environment or adjacent to a shop environment. But theoretically you could run it in the cloud, you could run it anywhere you want, you could run it on your phone. It's, it's basically the architecture is dependent on the specifics of what you're trying to accomplish, not necessarily, you know, a, there's no one best way or place for the, the agent to run. And, and once you have that agent running, an application is, is there it's almost always going to be some third party, you know, there's no MT Connect application per se. It's the official MT Connect application. This is the tool that's consuming data. So something that's looking for structured XML, uh, and it may be a monitoring software, it may be an MES, it may be an analytics package. Um, and generally where the application runs, what it does is beyond the scope of MT Connect. So we kind of go, we specify the behavior of the agent and the definitions that the agent must spit out, as well as the, the terminology that an adapter has to support. And that's where we stop. So MT Connect goes from device is proprietary, agent is usually proprietary, or sorry, adapter is proprietary, agent is, is open source most of the time, application is a free for all. And that's kind of at the, at the user user's side to decide what they want their application to do. Our point, the point that we're trying to accomplish is to get data out so that an application can consume it. We're not really aimed at one specific use case. There are common use cases and we, we build the functionality towards um, things that are current and likely future use cases for industrial data, yeah. but we don't specify or restrict that in the, in the development. The idea is to be as, as broad as possible. Oh, okay. Awesome. And then, what about the the, the communication uh, paradigm that it uses? Is it is it is it a publish subscribe mechanism? Can you talk to us about that? So it's it's not published and subscribed natively. So we MT Connect started in two thousand eight. Um, the impetus for it was sort of this is an interesting story. So um, the Machine Tool Builders Association in the United States puts on uh, a large trade show every two years called IMTS. One of the guys that runs that trade show happened to live next door to uh, like an ex Sun Microsystems executive. And I don't know if this was necessarily planned or just sort of a friendly invitation or something, but the Sun exec ended up uh, coming out to the, to the show in 2006 or 2008. I uh, took a look around and, and was this was sort of his first experience with machine tools and industrial equipment. And the, the frustration there and the sort of aha moment was wow. Uh, all this stuff is run by computers, but there's no networking, there's no connectivity, there's there's no nothing. <laughs> they, they, these machines don't talk to each other, and mm. we're 20 or 30 years behind the time. So from there, uh, it ended up with sort of a, a cat, an interesting cast of characters who'd been kind of kicking around ideas about what to do next. But the idea, was, the, the concept was sort of how do we get to a more connected factory? And this was you know, long before industry 4.0 was a thing, digital factory didn't exist as a buzzword. This, you know, the, the things that were popular in kind of the space at the time, you know, this was the very beginning of talking about big data, right? So that, could, that should give you a sense of kind of where we were yeah. in time. And then, so working backwards from what does a factory need to get closer to looking like, I don't know, your iPhone and less like an ancient set of computers that you would never use by choice and working backwards from that to kind of what needed to be solved. It was this interoperability challenge. So 
nothing could talk to each other. And if you can't talk to each other, you can't build the applications. You can't build the applications. You don't get the, the more modern consumer electronics looking environment. So at the time, uh, AMQP and MQTT and the public pub sub, the sub pub sub model was very much in competition and same, same reason why we use XML, right? So if we were to do this today, it would be JSON. Now, to answer your question about the protocol, so there's a baked in protocol to MT Connect, which was built in 2008 specifically to allow connectivity machine tools. But that protocol was only baked in because there was no data acquisition that was common on machine tools and discrete manufacturing factory equipment at the time. So conceptually, it was a stopgap that we would have our own protocol. Okay. The ideal for how this ought to work is you can separate your semantics from your protocol. So you really don't want to be defining, this is how I pull data off of equipment and how I get security, reliability, uh, you know, uptime and availability. You don't want to define all that stuff in the same spec necessarily that's defining, this is the definition of an axis. This is the definition of a door and an interlock. Right, those functions don't have to be connected to each other in any way. So where we stand today is next version of MT Connect will support uh, the same the same stateful RESTful interface as as it always has. It will also support MQTT. Um, there's an, a companion specification for OPC UA. So that basically means if your protocol is OPC, um, you set up your OPC server as you know, functioning as an, an MT Connect agent. So then you take the MT Connect data definitions, your OPC server, all the protocol is handled in OPC, the definitions, um, meaning the semantic definitions that are sort of industry specific terms, those are all covered by MT Connect and that passes over OPC. So it's kind of like a, it's sort of a weird time to be talking about protocol because obviously MQTT is, is massively hyped right now. OPC has been around for, for quite a while, but in the United States, it's not like every machine tool customer has an OPC server on their equipment still. Um, so where we're trying to go is at this point, basically hedge our bets and let you be, you know, you pick the protocol. Um, we want our standard to support whatever protocol the customer wants to use. We're, I don't know, six to eight months from, from getting to sort of parity with, with most of the most popular protocols being supported. Two or three years from now, it, it'll be, who knows what the protocol of choice will be. The semantics will be the same as they've been and we'll continue to support whatever the, the upcoming protocol is. As far as like the technical explanation of how the protocol works, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a developer. So my explanation tends towards sort of where we stand in the overall product map, not necessarily exactly what you'd use. I think for most customers, knowing built-in protocol versus somebody else's protocol is the piece that, that matters. Once you get into more specific questions about how do you exactly connect things uh, and how does a protocol work, I'm the wrong guy to be, to be discussing that piece. Oh, awesome. Now, well, our audience here is, uh, is, is, is typically made, out of, made up of uh, engineers and developers. So that's the people who'd want to start developing solutions uh, based on MT Connect right away. So can you talk to us about the, the developer support tools and, and programming frameworks for, for, for MT Connect? Yeah, sure. So it, it, things have really kicked off quite a bit in the last couple of years. The first, call it 10 years of the standard from 2008 to 2018, um, you know, there was a lot of progress on building the standard and the concept was always this would have a lot of open source tools we would this was you know it's always been a community industry effort right this is this is not a a, a paid project this is um companies coming together from equipment builders system integrators and customers saying we want to be selling better machines not selling access to our data because that's really not a valid uh, differentiator so where it stands now is, you know, tons of different projects on GitHub. The most supported and the easiest one to get started with if you're a developer now is the C++ agent. So start with that and explore at least how it works. Uh, the place where you're going to end up quickly is what's the adapter support look like. So if you have some device in mind or even a simulated device in mind, um, 
you'll either have to find an adapter that, that already exists. So I think there's a couple of open source adapter frameworks out there. None of them are super full featured. Um, there's a couple for things like small desktop 3D printers written in Python. Yeah. So those are those are a pretty good place to start if you're sort of looking at what's a 2021 developer who has an interest in industrial IoT. That's kind of a good place to start is like play with the agent, from the agent go to, okay, well, what's my data source going to be? Um, from there, then you get to the application, which I think in general, from what I've heard of the other people that have been on, on the show and kind of the conversations that you and I have been sort of having on the periphery, yeah. you know, I think the application piece of it. So how do I present data and show it and, and run analytics? I think for the people in our circle, that's mostly kind of an afterthought, I guess. I mean, you have to have in mind, what do I want to do with this data? But a lot of what we're working on is, is architecture, infrastructure, middleware. Um, and, and so maybe pick an application early on and then just nail that down, right? Like, don't worry about developing another application. Lots and lots and lots and lots of people are developing, you know, the next greatest analytics application for industrial. Um, if that's you and, and you're developing great analytics, well, in that case, spend less time on figuring out how the agent works just go for the sample data. Um, again, on the, on the website, mtconnect.org, there's developer resources and there's a sample agent that runs all the time. So you can just kind of ping that agent as your source data, build your application on that, and don't worry so much about how do you set up and configure an agent? Where do you get the adapter? Your, your question in that case is going to be, hey, you know, potential customer, does your equipment already support MT Connect? If yes, then we're ready to go with our application. If no, either you, the customer, need to figure out how that works, or uh, you need to find an integrator, or we need to work together to figure out where you're going to go to get that done. But as a, as a pure application developer, uh, understanding the plumbing isn't necessarily the place you want to be spending your time. On the other hand, if you're if you're the, the middleware guy and the, the functionality guy, pick a best-in-class application that can consume XML data, which is basically all of them. I mean, this is very straightforward. Uh, and then from there, figure out how do I develop that pipeline from device to adapter to agent, and then spit it out to your application. So that that's the path I would go down. Um, if you're brand new, there's there's lots of kind of tools and toys and, and sandboxy type stuff. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a lot better than it was three to five years ago when you know, there were kind of three or four languishing projects. There's more stuff out there that I'm not even aware yeah. of. People develop all kinds of stuff and it never comes back to the, to the MT Connect Institute. It just kind of thrives out in the wild without us. Oh, okay, yeah, totally agree. Yeah, absolutely. So well, for now, someone who's, who's, who's uh, listening or watching this could be asking the, the question, uh, what differentiates MT Connect from, from other communication standards? You know? So what would be your answer to that? So my answer to that is kind of echoing the same stuff we've already talked about to, to a large extent. So if you're looking for semantically defined data or semantic definitions where you have a full set of context in the data at the device, meaning if I hand this off, you know, five times to, to, to different people or parties or systems and it eventually ends up at, you know, one of those analytics applications or it ends up in the hands of a data scientist, that system or person has the, the industry specific contextual definition. So what does this thing mean and how does, how is it relevant to the other things around it? That is, is carried directly from place to place, to place, to place. So that you don't have to say, Oh, Hey, I'm a, I'm an analyst, but I don't understand what one, three, seven, six AB means. Let me go back and, and check with you know, every person down the down the path back to the manufacturer and the device to figure out what that's encoded to. You you know already, oh well that's that's spindle temperature or spindle load or position data or whatever. And and you can carry that information or you can interpret that information that's carried with the data from the beginning instead of having to work backwards and and parse and understand. Now that we're not the only semantic definitions for equipment. We're not even the only semantic definitions in, in kind of the discrete manufacturing space, but the, the o, for 95% for of people, what's different is if you're looking at OPC without a companion spec that has um, semantics on it or, or an industry data model, or if you're looking at, at MQTT 
without Spark Plug B and industry specific implementation in Spark Plug B, you're, you'll get definitions like this is this is a value. This you might even get into things like this is a temperature versus um, you know like other other specific data types. But you're not going to get the full industry semantics. And generally speaking, we're competing with either nothing. So you have a system and there is no semantic definition in the first place. And it's it's kind of just whatever the native terminology was is, is carried through. And then it's never translated until there's a, a, an ad hoc requirement to normalize. Or we're competing with sort of a, a unified pr uh, proprietary model where you say, ah, our, you know, we're giant aerospace company XYZ, we need all of our data to be in, in kind of like a, a unified uh, standardized set of terms. We'll do that at the enterprise level and then we'll shove that down to all of our manufacturing facilities. And in that case, you know, it, it's proprietary model versus standardized model. Many of the times those proprietary models are going to be built on uh, sort of like a federated standards model where you know your machine tools are going to be MT Connect. Maybe your building management is BACnet. If you have packaging lines, those would be PACML. If you have um, you know surface mount technology for for circuit boards, that's its own industry uh, domain specifics. There's uh, models for business data, not just process and manufacturing data, and kind of smushing all those together into this. You know, maybe you have 15 different standard information models that then stack up into your corporate model, which then uh, you know, may or may not actually align with, with one master standard that's out there in the universe. So the, I mean, the differentiator is there aren't that many fully robust and fully baked machine tool and discrete manufacturing semantic, uh, definitions. And, you know, in, in European markets, there's a spec called, um, it, it's actually just, it doesn't have a full name. It's the OPC, uh, machine tool companion specification by VDMA or VDW, which is the German machine tool builder and, and mechanical engineering um, association. So there's a spec out of, out of Germany. We haven't seen that much of it in the United States being deployed, but in theory, if you have a VD, VDW uh, supporting machine and an MT Connect supporting machine, there's utilities that can allow you to, to translate back and forth. In China, there's a spec called NC Link which is built off of a combination of the VDW model and the, um, and the MT Connect model. It natively supports MQTT, which is a nice differentiator there. But again, if you have MT Connect definitions and NC Link definitions, there are utilities that allow you to go both. So the, the main concept here is sort of these federated models. The differentiation is we have semantic definitions, which you otherwise just don't have unless you're using one of these specs. As much as I want everybody to use MT Connect, I think my my main my main mission is you can't do anything with your data if it's not semantically defined, and if you don't use some standard that's out there to 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 apply to your data definitions, you're hurting yourself in terms of scalability and future maintenance. So my preference is think about whether you need semantic definitions. If you if you just have two two data items and you're never going to scale up, you really don't need the full semantics. If you want you know enterprise wide or even just a system or a cell wide, then you need the semantics, at which point evaluate whether there's a, a spec out there that already does this. If you've already had people that got together and defined things, if so, use any and all of them that you can uh, and let MT Connect be one of that if you have equipment that, that is uh, able to support MT Connect. And that will make your life much, much easier and you'll be much happier in the end. And I'll be happy because you're happy. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So maybe just to 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 make it uh, to give a clearer picture of where uh, MT Connect could be useful, can you give us like some common uh, use cases in industrial IoT for MT Connect? Yeah, number one use case by far is is still monitoring. So this is basically stack light sort of stuff, red, yellow, green status reports, alerts, alarms, uptime, um, some OEE calculation. But your your sort of shop floor monitoring is still the bread and butter use case. The next two use cases that are probably most common are predictive um, predictive analytics. So that's health and maintenance data. Um, a lot of there's been a ton of work on sort of calculating failures for rotating equipment and and in our space you know everything's got a spindle on it which means uh spindle is an excellent sort of target use case for uh, really good predictive analytics and maintenance same thing with sort of like tool wear and tool life prediction um 
some in sort of like coolant management type type applications, but but basically so anything where you can predict what's going to happen next needs good data being fed into it, uh, saving yourself the kind of data scrubbing or data munging effort of, of trying to translate that stuff allows analysts and data scientists to be analysts and data scientists instead of data plumbers and masters of copying and pasting. So that that's the the two most popular use cases. The biggest up and coming use case is digital twin, um, which in our case, I, I would say, I, I hate to say digital twin because it's so vague and so right. broad in terms of what it actually applies to. But what we're talking about is a, a simulation that goes beyond simulation, uses real time or near real, near real time data from a piece of equipment and represents the current state as as built, as installed, as used, and as running, and as it exists right now, and kind of the the twin piece of it is any application that needs that sort of live concurrent simulation next to or you know conceptually adjacent to the actual equipment itself. So there's a function on machine tools uh, referred to as as look ahead, which basically just means you've loaded a part program. Uh, you, uh, you you can basically pause the machine running itself and just simulate going a little bit ahead in the program and say, okay, what's what's going to happen next uh, after the step that I'm in in the program? And that allows an operator to sort of uh, prepare for a, a piece that's been difficult or if they've had uh, you know some sort of um, mismatch between what they expected to happen and what's been happening when they run the part, that allows them to, to sort of like run it without running it, but it's kind of simulation at the at the machine as opposed to like a full-blown offline separate simulation to verify that you're not going to blow the machine up or crash the part or something like that. So so look ahead and kind of like a bunch of other features that that are shoving this kind of real-time concurrent simulation with regular updates to an operator, uh, a, a manufacturing engineer, a plant manager, the people that are kind of closest to the actual function of the equipment. That's a really promising use case now, which of course is being advertised as digital twin, right? So like it, oh, yeah. it's it's this very, very broad buzzword. Um, and I think if you're really trying to look at digital twin applications, being specific about you know vendor X, Y, or Z, what is this twin for? what does it do and why will it make my life better and, and how does it work? That piece is kind of still really not sorted out yet. So I consider digital twin very hot as a, as a use case for MT connect. And it's very much driving what we want to develop it towards. Like we, we don't want to not be able to support these digital twin applications, but it's also sort of a scary space because of the lack of specificity and, and lack of, detail and what people are actually looking for. And that, you know, that leads to mismatched expectations versus what they actually get. So, you know, I say be specific about a function, not, don't necessarily use the buzzword. You can say digital twin to kick the conversation off. And then after yeah. that, talk about what the function actually is. Awesome. Okay, so you, 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 you mentioned uh, the combination of uh, uh, MT Connect and OPC UA. So uh, maybe if you can give a, a clarity there uh, as to under what circumstances would you need such an integration? So this is a, this is kind of customer choice. Generally speaking, um, OPC is a much more robust communication protocol than what's baked into MT Connect. So if you have a larger system, if you have a more sensitive system, if you have a full IT team, um, if you have, you know, many, many locations, meaning, you know, multiple sites, you want the extra robustness and security features that are added by something like OPC. So the you you really don't want to like it's it's nice to use the MT Connect protocol if you just want to pull data off a couple of machines. Um, but once you kind of grow up past that, we see customers that are looking for you know give me a more fully blown IT OT integration. I have the resources to bear to. Uh, have you know have staff and have the, the funding to actually build up that infrastructure a bit more. At which point you're really not a tire kicker. You're not testing the waters. That's not really a pilot program. That's a full blown you know corporate ITOT project at that point. Okay. Yeah. So you 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 touched a bit on security at the beginning of this talk. 
Uh, would you like maybe expand on how uh, uh, security is implemented in an empty connect system? I knew, so I knew this question was coming and I know it's coming <laughs> for everybody that you talk to. <laughs> and, you know, I'm very cynical about this overall because everybody's kicking the can or, uh, you know, trying to toss the hot potato or pick your analogy of choice. Nobody wants it to be their problem. Yeah. Um, which is super frustrating from a customer's perspective because they just want it to be one person's problem that they could pay and fix. MC, and here and now, now that I've said that, of course, I'll explain why it's not MC Connect's problem. Um, definitions for data are not inherently secure or insecure. So, you know, saying that MT Connect is secure or isn't secure is like saying, you know, is French secure or is English secure or is German secure? The language itself is not secure or insecure you can you can include things in the language whether it's it's concepts or terminology that allow a security system to sort of implement better practices so that would be things like you know user account controls or something like that so if we specify things like an operator and we supply data about a machine or, or we supply enough id data to be able to link you know operator x is authorized to uh, operate machine tool A. You know the, the standard itself doesn't create the security, but we can make the hooks and create the features and functions that will support secure you know features and functions. That's sort of like the high level why you're not going to get security solved by your semantic model. Um, to be more helpful and be more specific, if you roll out MT Connect with the default protocol, it supports uh, HTTPS and the expectation is that you kind of have a one-way communication. So data comes off of the equipment and doesn't go back to the equipment. So you can't command the machine to, you know, do something bad uh, from, a, from a, rogue, uh, a rogue actor or something like that. So, it, you know, our role in security is, is don't do something that will create a bunch of extra vulnerabilities and be, you know, able to support the best practices, tools, standard and specs, and sort of still emerging industry practices for ITOT security. We've got a bunch of people that are specialists, mostly from sort of larger multinational Fortune 500 sort of manufacturers. Those guys have a huge interest in this. Um, they've assigned resources to, to try and advise MT Connect on how that works. Like I said, it's an industry developed um, organization. So we've got your your specialists in the equipment. We've also, over the last three to five years, had uh, quite a lot of specialists in the security side kind of weighing in as well to try and make sure we don't we don't break something for everybody. Oh, okay, awesome. Okay, so now in in conclusion, uh, can you tell us about the organization behind uh, MT Connect, the the Association for Manufacturing Technology, and also about the MT Connect Institute? Sure. So the AMT is the Association for Manufacturing Technology, which represents um, machine tool builders and distributors and a bunch of other categories of, of manufacturing equipment here in the United States. Um, we were founded in 1902 as the National Machine Tool Builders Association and expanded to cover quite a bit more um, categories of equipment in the, in the 90s. So a AMT really kick the standard off, the MT Connect standard off based on that conversation I was telling you about the IMTS meeting yeah. and kind of big picture vision for the future works backwards to what can we do to fix this. Now, standards bodies require some sort of a neutral third party arbiter in most cases to, to get industry wide acceptance and adoption. So the MT Connect Institute is a subsidiary of AMT. It's a volunteer organization. Um, you know, we have the three three categories of, of people represented there are machine and equipment builders, software developers and system integrators, and, and customers, you know, aerospace, automotive, uh, medical device, all the other manufacturers. So those those people come together. There's, I want to say, 400 people um, on the standards committee getting together to actually produce the spec. My job is the sort of chief administrator and uh, manager of making sure that 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 organization can continue to function. So I'm responsible for sort of all the the day to day stuff in the MT Connect Institute itself. So it's a it's a free free organization to participate in. It, by contributing, you get quite a bit of advance notice on what's actually coming next. 
as well as the ability to kind of influence direction on what things we ought to be focusing on. Um, it's also fun and interesting. I know it might not sound fun to be talking about the definitions of words, but uh, these are these are really bright people that are solving big problems. And I'm consistently surprised and impressed by uh, the sort of talent that's that's gravitated towards Empty Connect. And it's why I've, I'm kind of stuck around for as long as I have and had as much interest in continuing to, to develop the spec. So take a look at emptyconnect.org. There's information there about how to join if you're interested, or you can connect with me on LinkedIn and I'll walk you through the process. Okay, awesome. Yeah, so I was mentioning recently on uh, one of the posts there on LinkedIn that, you know, uh, for you to, to to really know exactly what to use and, and when to use it, you, you better in, get involved, you know, with, with these standards to find out exactly how they work, you know, and then you get to drive the direction uh, where you want these things to go. So I really encourage people to 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 join in and check it out and see what they can uh, contribute to to the standard there. Yeah, I think one of your last guests on here uh, was talking about your sort of minimum requirement to really know what, to not to not shoot yourself in the foot and be subject to the whims of some somebody else's decisions. You know, get in there as a yeah. watcher and, and be be able to observe what's happening. That doesn't cost anything. It's a, a minimal time commitment. Um, and then from there, you can decide the extent to which you actually want to contribute resources to, to working on it. We, we do everything remote, too, for the most part. So even prior to, to coronavirus, we were, um, I would say, 85 or 90 percent of the work was remote. And we would do three or four times a year we'd meet in person. But generally, we were pretty good about uh, minimizing cost to the to the volunteer organization. Awesome. OK, so that brings us to the end of this session. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and thank you for sharing your insights with us today. Appreciate it so much. Talk to you soon.